which is a statement by Michael Russell on an update on actions following the outcome of the EU referendum. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. Until the end of his statement. And I call on Michael Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and forgive me if I croak my way through this statement. I'm sure the Chamber will be suitably supportive and sympathetic. Uh, this is our third statement, Presiding Officer, updating Parliament on our actions following the EU referendum and the overwhelming vote in Scotland to remain. The First Minister last updated Parliament on the 7th of September. Today I'd like to give the Chamber more information about developments since that statement. Reassuring our fellow EU citizens about their future right to continue living and working here remains of vital importance. Present Tory rhetoric balances their future against that of UK citizens living in Europe, who are equally uncertain about their prospects. Using human beings as bargaining chips cannot ever be justified. The UK should take the lead and end this uncertainty now. The impact on EU nationals living in the e UK is just one of many problems the Brexit vote has created, all of which have been compounded by the reaction, inaction and confusion of the Conservative government at Westminster. Our approach, in contrast, has been to seek consensus, to establish clear priorities, <laughs> to establish clear priorities and to propose solutions to those problems in keeping with the democratic mandate that we have, a triple mandate arising from the election in 2016, the vote on June the 23rd, and the vote of this Parliament on the 28th of June. Since my appointment, I've pursued that mandate at every opportunity. I've met twice with the UK Brexit Secretary David Davis, most recently on Friday, along with the Secretary of State, and colleagues have met with Treasury Ministers and the Trade Secretary. I've been to Cardiff to identify common ground with Mark Drakeworth, my Welsh counterpart, met with representatives of the London Mayor's Office, and our officials have been engaged with the Northern Ireland Executive. I have begun a series of meetings with party leaders, with Willie Rennie and Patrick Harvey, and I look forward to meeting Kezia Dugdale and Ruth Davidson. We have, above all, been pressing hard for a mechanism to deliver the full involvement promised by the Prime Minister. The Joint Ministerial Committee finally met on Monday. The First Minister and I, along with our counterparts from the devolved administrations, attended the meeting in Downing Street, chaired by the Prime Minister. The meeting considered the means by which the devolved administrations could and should engage with the UK government on the development of a negotiating position for our future relationship with the European Union. This was a long overdue meeting, but unfortunately it was in large part hugely frustrating. In line with the wishes of this parliament, as expressed during recent debates, the First Minister set out Scotland's key interests in protecting our place in the single market, securing continued freedom of movement, and protecting social and employment rights. She also pressed, along with colleagues, for more information on the high-level negotiating stance of the UK government and some indication of how it would take forward engagement with the 27 remaining EU members. However, we know no more about the UK government's approach now than we did when we went into Downing Street. We do not know whether the UK government is in favour of membership of the single market or the customs union or what type of relationship is envisaged between the UK and the EU after Brexit, or indeed how and when these decisions will be made. We did secure agreement that the JMC in plenary session will meet more frequently with another meeting promised for the new year before the triggering of Article 50. To put that in context, presiding officer, the last meeting of the JMC plenary before this week was in 2014. It was also agreed that a subcommittee be established to discuss the issues raised by Brexit. That subcommittee, the JMC EU negotiation, will meet for the first time early next month. Following a proposal from the First Minister, agreement was reached that a detailed work programme was to be established ahead of the first meeting, which must be linked to the timetable for and the key points anticipated in the overall Brexit negotiating process. This timetable must ensure that issues are discussed in sufficient time to inform the UK Government's European Subcommittee's decision-making process. The Scottish Government will take part in as many meetings as necessary in order to ensure that that is the case. And I shall be speaking to David Davis later today about these issues. Let me make it clear to Parliament. The Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, indeed the people of Scotland, are and must be equal partners in this multinational United Kingdom. The Scottish Government will not be and is not simply a consultee or a stakeholder. 
That is not what the Parliament or the country asked us to do. There is a huge amount of work to do to satisfy the Prime Minister's own requirement for a UK approach and objective for negotiations before she triggers Article 50. As the Welsh First Minister said after Monday's meeting, time is against us. Given there are only 18 weeks between the first meeting of the JMCEN and the UK Government's self-imposed March deadline for triggering the Article 50 process. 18 weeks, 126 days. We cannot afford to lose a single one of them given the vital importance of the task. A task that includes ensuring that the UK and Scotland does not drive straight off a hard Brexit cliff. Presiding Officer Monday made it clear than ever that there at present no coherent UK plan. But there has to be a Scottish plan, and ideally there should be one that is good for the UK too. Alongside our efforts to influence the United Kingdom to adopt a soft Brexit with continued membership of the single market, the Scottish Government will bring forward our own detailed proposals to protect Scotland's interests by the end of this year. A key part of those proposals will be ways in which we can maintain membership of the single market for Scotland, even if the rest of the UK leaves. I've noted recent comments by Alec Rowley and by David Watt of the Institute of Directors in Scotland, which suggest a consensus position on the key issue of immigration may be possible. We will continue to seek advice from the Standing Council to seek agreement on this and other key issues, and I remain open to proposals from all the other parties. This Parliament also gave Ministers a mandate to engage with other European nations and institutions to ensure Scotland's position is heard. Since our last statement to, to Parliament, the First Minister attended the Arctic Circle Assembly, where she met with the President, Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary of Iceland and the Deputy Prime Minister of Finland. The Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs has met with the Taoiseach and the Irish Foreign Secretary, as well as Ministers from the French, Italian and Maltese governments. In addition, along with continued engagement with the diplomatic community in Scotland, we've also met with the Chief and Deputy Chief Ministers for Gibraltar. Fiona Hislop and I visited Brussels last week. We spent time with Scottish MEPs, as well as with Guy Verhofstadt, who forms part of the European Parliament's negotiating team, and with Danuta Hubner, the Chair of the Parliament's Constitutional Affairs Committee, which will take forward scrutiny of Brexit. And of course, the views of this Parliament remain crucial to establishing the principles behind our approach. My cabinet colleagues and I have taken part in very useful debates on the implications of the EU referendum, and this series will continue with the debate on the environment tomorrow. Members will also know that this Scottish Government was elected with a clear mandate that the Scottish Parliament should have the right to hold an independence referendum if there was a significant and material change in the circumstances that prevailed in 2014, such as Scotland being taken out of the EU against our will. That is a direct quote from the manifesto on which we stood and won. And we're now faced with that specific scenario. As a result, in the immediate aftermath of the EU referendum, we said we would prepare the required legislation to enable a new referendum to be held if it became clear that this was the only or the best way of protecting those interests. We repeated that commitment to Parliament in our programme for government. Last Thursday, we published a consultation on a draft referendum bill. This consultation invites views on the draft legislation and technical arrangements for a referendum. This will ensure that the draft referendum bill is to be ready for introduction, should it be, in the opinion of the government, the right way to proceed. Presiding officer, the people of Scotland in every local authority area voted to remain in the EU. That is an inescapable fact and is recognised by every party in this chamber. We have therefore sought and will continue to seek to work with every party to ensure that the democratic, economic and social advantages of our engagement with and connection to Europe continue to benefit us as a nation. There is much we can do together. We can continue to seek answers from the UK Government on the most basic of questions. We can continue to bring forward solutions to the problems created by the Brexit vote. We can continue to assert our right to be treated as an equal partner. And we can, as the FM said this morning, and we must, come together to form an all-Scotland coalition to protect our place in the single market, regardless of our views on the Constitution. And we can resolve to ensure the best outcome for Scotland and all the people who live here, all of them, including those who come from elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. The Minister will now take around 20 minutes of questions. I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Adam Tompkins to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I thank, the, <coughs> I thank the Minister for early sight of his statement, and I wish him and his sore throat a full and speedy recovery. Yesterday, uh, this, win this year's winner of the Booker Prize for Fiction was announced. And already, I think we know what one of the leading contenders for next year's prize is going to be. Nicola Sturgeon's programme for government, with its commitment to place education centre stage. A candidate not because it was particularly well written, but because, judged by any standard, it is a work of fantasy. It does indeed require a great leap of imagination to conjure the image of an SNP government that is not obsessed with independence. Yet what we saw last week with the publication of this document was a simple copy and paste job. The question, we're told, will be the same. A simple majority will decide it. A Section 30 order will be required as before, and the campaign rules are unchanged. But the SNP forgot to copy and paste the fact that we've already answered this question. We said no. And the SNP signed an agreement that they would abide by and respect the answer. So why have they ratted on that agreement? Now, I know we often have to remind the SNP that they are now a minority government, but they seem to have interpreted this as a mandate to govern in the interests only of the 45 and not in the interests of a clear majority of Scots who said no to independence. We hear a lot, we hear a lot of loose talk about mandates. We heard some talk about mandates in the ministerial statement a few moments ago about mandates, material change and the like. But the truth, presiding officer, is that there is one and only one Indiref to trigger, and that's a substantial and sustained spike in the opinion polls in favour of independence. So given that there has been no such shift in public opinion, why is the Scottish Government wasting everybody's time? Minister. Presiding officer, I, I think Mr Tompkins might want to reflect when he reads the official report on the reality of what I've said and his question, because they don't match each other. The points that I made were about the serious existential threat that lies to Scotland in the Brexit process. It was seeking a uh, working together to answer those threats and those questions. It was looking for information from the Conservative Party, which obviously north and south of the border has no idea and no thought about what is going ahead. It can only bluff and bluster. Let me say to Mr Tompkins and his colleagues, I remain very willing to enter into serious discussion about the issues we have to resolve in Scotland in circumstances which we did not ask for, which we have been dragged into, and which threaten our future prosperity and indeed much else in our nation. When Mr Tompkins is ready to address those issues, I am ready to answer them. Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Joan McAlpine. I too thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement. He quoted Carwin Jones who said on Monday that time is against us and, the, and Mr Russell counted the days until the day that Theresa May plans to trigger Article 50. He rightly said we cannot afford to lose a single one of them. And we do indeed need to know the UK government's approach and objectives for negotiations. But we need to know a bit more about the Scottish government's priorities and objectives. Too. The Minister says he will bring forward the Government's own detailed proposals, but he says he will do so only by the end of this year. Well, that is 66 days away, and days we surely cannot afford to lose. Will the Minister not follow the good practice he has commended to others and go beyond the high principles to tell us precisely what he will be saying to colleagues on the Joint Ministerial Committee. If membership of the single market is the red line for the Scottish Government, what does he propose in relation to the customs union, to agriculture and fisheries, to trade with third parties, all of which lie within the European Union but lie out with the single market? And if it will take him 66 days to answer those questions, will he undertake today to engage fully with other parties in this parliament, not as consultees, but as partners in finalising those positions in the same way as he calls on UK ministers to engage with the Scottish and other devolved administrations? Minister. I'm very happy on the second point to say that I, I stand ready to have those conversations. Uh, and indeed, uh, I spoke to Kezia Dugdale yesterday briefly uh, to say that we were very keen to have a, a meeting. We haven't got that meeting set up next yet, but I'm sure uh, Mr MacDonald will go back and, and ask Kezia Dugdale's office uh, to expedite that matter. 
On the first point, uh, I assure him there will be less than 66 days. We do not intend to publish it between Christmas and New Year. So we're already counting down to the publication date. It is very important that the Standing Council influence this, this process uh, uh, in an important manner. There is a lot of detailed work being gone, done. We have already indicated that there are options to be looked at. I think he should bear with us and work with us as we develop the right option for Scotland, which we also believe will be the right option for the UK. And in that regard, I, I quote the Prime Minister at the European Council on Friday, who said that the right option for the UK would also be the right option for the EU. In Scottish and UK terms, we believe the same. We can find an option that works well for Scotland, a differentiated option that works for the rest of the UK, and that's what we intend to try and do. I'd be very happy to work with any party in this chamber who wants to do that. I indicated in what I said that I thought Mr Rowley's contribution on the matter of migration was very helpful, um, and I think the more we have that type of contribution and that discussion, the better it will be. Jim McAlpine to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. With the EU Trade Commissioner recently saying that if we can't make it with Canada, I don't think we can make it with the UK, does the Minister think that the UK Government has been overselling its claims about the opportunity to fully negotiate global trade deals? Minister. I think there has been a great degree of incoherence in the message coming from the UK Government about the possibilities of establishing trade deals. I note that the um, I think it was the Secretary General of the World Trade Organization who said after Liam Fox's speech that Liam Fox misunderstood what the WTO was. It wasn't the World Free Trade Organization, it was the World Trade Organization. And the World Trade Organization has a whole range of tariffs and issues which would arrive into any set of negotiations. There is, I think, a sense of unreality in many of these uh, statements coming from the UK government. Uh, I think that would be something that we could take uh, with tolerance were it not that the implications of those are so serious, because failing to get this right will lead to prolonged and very serious financial difficulties for each one of us. And we need to remember that. Alexander Stewart to be followed by Polly McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister and the Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe have talked much of protecting Scotland's interests and addressing the uncertainty that faces Scottish businesses following the United Kingdom's decision to leave the EU. Can the Minister please explain to this chamber how ripping Scotland out of the UK, a single market to which it exports more than four times as much as it does to the European Union, constitutes protecting Scotland's interests? Minister. I think there is a, a worrying uh, worrying tendency now in the Scottish Tory party to become obsessed with independence. I would, I would encourage them, I would encourage them, I would encourage them, I would encourage, I would encourage Mr Stewart and his colleagues to look, uh, to look at higher things, to look at some of the issues which we need to address over the next 126 days. Because Mr Stewart may be able to bluster like Mr Tompkins, they may bluster for the Tory party, but all they are doing is letting Scotland down unless they've prepared, unless they are prepared, unless they are prepared. Thank you. Mr Tompkins is now waving the independence referendum bill. He is obviously sleeps with it under his pillow. He is so fond of the idea. The reality is we have a lot of work to do. I would dearly like the Tories to be part of that work instead of standing sniping on the sidelines. Pauline McNeill to be followed by Ross Dreher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On this side of the Chamber, we agree that the rhetoric at the Conservative Party conference was toxic and hugely unhelpful when it comes to reassuring EU nationals about their status in the UK, people who have chosen not only to work, but to make Scotland their home. I would like to ask the Minister, in terms of transparency on the negotiations that you're currently having, whether you can publish any minutes, provide any detailed insights into the discussions you're having on this point. And, for example, what have you put to Theresa May precisely on this question? What are the options available on the table that would give legal certainty to EU nationals who clearly want to remain here but want this protection? Minister. Uh, thank you. I should have indicated that Pauline McNeill has also made contributions to the issue on migration and the movement of people, which I think have been very helpful in this debate, and I'm grateful to her for it. Um, the, I don't think anybody would be in any doubt 
about what took place at that meeting, I, I think better than a minute was the, were the interviews with the First Minister when she left Downing Street. They had the ring of veracity after two very frustrating hours. Um, the reality is that we have made it clear that a simple statement now to say that those who are presently here and resident here will be able to stay would begin to solve this problem. That is what is required. Uh, and if that statement was made, then we could move on from this stage. We then need to look at the whole issue of migration. But there was, as members will know, a report at the weekend that indicated that uh, Scotland would be short of 100,000 members of its workforce without free movement of people. And that's an immensely important figure. And it cannot simply be that decisions will be made about free movement and refusing free movement without addressing the realities of the situation for Scotland and the Scottish economy. Scotland is not full up. I represent a constituency that has a severe problem of depopulation. And to approach this issue as an issue that only affects the southeast of England will do an enormous disservice to the people of Scotland. I believe we can get a, a, an answer on immigration which would uh, suit this chamber, suit Scotland and should suit the UK. And I hope all members will help me to do that. Ross Greer to be followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you. Like others, I appreciate an advanced copy of the Minister's statement and the Greens welcome the opportunity to meet uh, with the Minister, which Patrick uh, Harvey and myself will be doing so soon. Following the answer to Polly McNeill's question, could the Minister confirm what work the Government is doing to provide further evidence of the vital contribution that uh, citizens from the rest of the European Union make to our health and social care services and to the damage which would be done to these services by Scotland being dragged out of the European Union, particularly under a hard Brexit scenario? Uh, I, thank, I, I thank the Member for that. There are a, a, a whole range of statistics that prove the point that he is making and the workforce statistics in the health service and the social care service uh, make the point for him. 9% of our doctors come from other European countries. 12% of our social care workforce come from other European countries. There is a, a great deal of material now on the table and a great deal of material being produced that testifies to the severe problems that will be caused for all parts of, of the public service by the changes that are being proposed. That also, if I might say, presiding officer, puts into sharp relief uh, a request that is constantly made to the Scottish Government that we should say what we want in terms of the devolved competencies. This is not just about the devolved competencies. The whole issue of the single market, the way the single market operates, free movement of people, free movement of goods, the ability of companies to act, work else, uh, to set themselves up elsewhere, passporting, they are all matters that deeply affect the devolved areas of competence, though they may not be devolved. And therefore, that is another reason why Scotland must be at the heart of the discussions and the negotiations. Tavish Scott to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, also thank the Minister for an advanced copy of his statement and, and uh, sympathise with his ailments. I hope they weren't caused by all the shouting in London on, uh, on Monday. Uh, a month before the European referendum, Theresa May warned Goldman Sachs of the consequences for the UK uh, in leaving the single market. The Prime Minister now, of course, considers ending the free movement of people across the EU as more important than the single market itself. Wouldn't it be helpful uh, if instead of telling American bankers why the single market matters, she made that case to her cabinet? Uh, and would this government in Scotland recognise that the chaos caused by the UK government's current position is not helped by the uncertainty over Scottish independence either? Minister. I was with the member all the way until the last sentence. Um, but no, we will have to find something to disagree on. Uh, I don't agree with his last sentence, but I do agree with the rest of it. And indeed, he is familiar with the old Westminster maxim, the vote follows the voice. And it is fairly astonishing to discover that the voice of the Prime Minister was saying that Brexit would be a disaster, and now she is telling us to whistle a happy tune and to believe that everything will be well. I would call that hypocrisy. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The UK Government appears to be working towards sectoral deals for the City of London and also car making. Does the Minister believe that Scotland should be treated as a special case given the overwhelming vote to remain here? Minister. I think there's no doubt that differentiated deals are going to be of great importance. I think what Scotland will require to consider is if it is possible for the UK government to consider differentiation for the City of London, if it is possible for the UK government to consider differentiation for the Japanese car factories in the northeast of England, 
why would it not be possible for them to consider differentiation for Scotland? It makes no logical or political or economic sense. Differentiation is also, uh, unionists might want to consider, the basis on which the United Kingdom was established and the basis on which devolution was set up. So if you are against differentiation, you are against the thing you're trying to defend. It seems wildly illogical. Rachel Hamilton, be followed by Christina McKelvey. Theresa May and David Davis are fully committed to engaging with all devolved administrations, including the Scottish Government, as an equal partner. They are open to proposals that Mike Russell submits to the Joint Ministerial Committee. What evidence can the Minister share with the Parliament that he and his ministerial colleagues are cooperating with the UK Government so that we can obtain the best deal for Scotland and the UK rather than threatening to break up our country? Minister. I am reminded, presiding officer, of that line, I think, from the ballad about Sheriff Muir. If you had seen what I had seen, <laughs> I was in the room. I saw the willingness of the Prime Minister. It was not as you describe it. <laughs> Christina Mulcahy, to be followed by Anna Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Following on from suggestions that hard right Tory MPs are planning to insert a sunset clause into Theresa May's Brexit bill, which would see all EU laws automatically expire after five years and a bid to scrap red tape, does the Minister agree with Antonia Bans, Head of Campaigns of the Trade Union Congress, who said yesterday, as we all know, that this is how workers' rights come under threat? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Could I correct the record? Um, Ms. Ferguson reminds me the song I was referring to was Killy Cranky and not Sheriff Muir. I wouldn't like to mislead Parliament about folk songs. Um, the First Minister laid out a series of uh, tests for the options which we are considering in a speech she made to the IPPR in July. And uh, those tests included the economic test, the democratic test, and the test of social protection. And Christina McKelvey is absolutely right to say that guaranteeing social protection, not just the continuation of the existing social protections, but the continuing improvement in social protection, which the EU is committed to, will be vital for Scotland's national interest. It is also tied up within the single market. And if you undermine and remove the single market, you undermine and remove social protections. So the idea of a sunset clause, as, as proposed by a very right-wing ex-Tory chairman, uh, is in actual fact an attempt to undermine that and should be resisted with vigour. And I ask our word to be followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, President Officer. It's becoming increasingly clear that Scotland is caught between two nationalist governments, both obsessed with rhetoric and wildly inaccurate claims about taking back control. But in reality, neither in the least concerned about the impact leaving either the EU or the UK will have on people's jobs, on public services, on people's right to live and work across the EU or indeed the UK, or trade opportunities that exist in the EU and across the UK for companies who export. Given the Scottish Government delivered in short order an economic impact report on leaving the EU, just when is the same report going to be published on the same terms on Scotland leaving the UK. Just two years ago, this government was relaxed about challenging the single market and relaxed about threatening freedom of movement. We've heard today again about the hard Brexit cliff. Why is this government so relaxed about the hard independence cliff? Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, could I, give two pieces of, could I give two pieces of friendly advice to Anna Swarwar? Uh, the first is that you are bound to be on the wrong side if Mike Rumbles is applauding you. <laughs> um, and, the second one, and, the second, and the second one is there are, there are people on his benches who are making a sensible, thoughtful uh, contribution to this debate because they realise how serious it is. I have spoken about Polly McNeill, I've spoken about Alec Rowley, uh, Mr Macdonald is doing so too. He would be well placed to emulate them. What he has just asked doesn't do him any credit and it certainly doesn't do his party any benefit. We have problems to solve. I look forward when I sit down, when I sit down with Kezia Dugdale, I look forward to discussing how we solve those problems. I can't imagine that Anna Sarwar will need to be in the room if that is his type of contribution. Willie Coffey, <laughs> followed by James Dornan. Thank you. Given that the UK government promised to treat Scotland as an equal partner in the Union, then swiftly moved to introduce English votes for English laws, and now looks determined to ignore the 62% of Scots who voted to remain in the, UAE, the, the EU, does the Minister think this kind of behaviour by the UK 
is consistent with those promises that were made to Scotland? Minister. No, I, of course I don't. And the Prime Minister has said that she thought Scotland should be fully engaged and, and fully involved. The Prime Minister talked about a UK position, not a UK government position, but a UK position before Article 50 is triggered. None of those things are, are coming to fruition as yet. Uh, Rachel Hamilton believes that the Prime Minister is well-intentioned in this matter. I have still to see it, but I'm still waiting, and if it does happen to be the case, I shall be pleased. So far, I won't be holding my breath for it. James Doran to be followed finally by John Scott. Thank you, President Officer. Given the meeting the Minister had on Monday with the PM and the heads of the devolved assemblies, assemblies mentioned before, does he have any worries on the potential impact on education in Scotland? And does he agree with Professor Sir Timothy O'Shea, uh, Timothy O'Shea who said on Monday that the potential impact of Brexit on higher education ranges from bad to awful to catastrophic? Minister. Mr Dornan, Dornan raises a, a very important point. The issue of the impact on higher education, and particularly higher education research, is crucial in these discussions, and I'm grateful to him for raising that serious point. Uh, Tim O'Shea's contribution was, as ever, measured but de in depth. Tim O'Shea knows more about the running of universities and higher education in the UK and indeed globally than most people. And when he is using that language, he is using it, I think, in a considered fashion. Uh, we have to ensure that in the process that we are now embarked upon, we need to have detail at an early date about how the UK government intends to take forward uh, these proposals that do not damage higher education, in particular, do not damage involvement in Horizon 2020, in Erasmus, and also in the flow of talent uh, into and out of uh, this country. There's an invidious possibility, which we're just beginning to hear about and see, which is senior academics and, and, and in universities, it is a talent game. Senior academics who might want to come to Scotland or the UK to further their career, who might be tempted with the offers that they're being made, are also looking at Scotland and the UK and saying, is this a place that will welcome me? Is it a place that can sustain me? And will the connections be worth having? And if the answer to any of those is no, they won't come. That will lead to a diminution of our excellence and we must avoid that at all costs. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, what discussions has Mr Russell had with the Secretary of State, David Mundell, with a view to developing a joint approach to representing Scotland's position as our governments approach the Brexit negotiations? And if he has held such discussions, what matters were agreed on? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank Mr Scott for that question. I'm more than willing, and uh, the Secretary of State has raised this with me, I'm more than willing on some occasion to uh, attend events at which we will both speak. I'm more than willing to listen to sectors, and I'm quite sure that we can cooperate in that way. But it would have to be done on the basis of equality. It would have to be done on the basis that we are there to listen and also to put our point of view. And the outcome of those would have to be to have to influence the negotiating position. If we can achieve those things, I have no difficulty. Can I thank the Minister and members uh, for the contributions? We will now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 2099 in the name of Keith Brown. I will give a few minutes to change seats.